Have you ever wondered why animals look the way they do? Why they're shaped the way they're shaped, or why they move the way they move? Ever since I was a kid, I've been fascinated by the world around me, and in particular about how things work. But it wasn't until late in my college career that I came across the field of biomechanics. As it turns out, I'm not the first one who wondered how animals worked. In fact, the beginnings of biomechanics go all the way back to Aristotle and his essays, De Motu Animalium, or On the Movement of Animals. Since that time, several pioneering researchers have advanced the field, like Giovanni Borelli, who published his own works, De Motu Animalium. In these, he applied the principles of physics and mathematics to the understanding of form and function of both animals and humans. And my own personal hero, Etienne Marais, whose incredible creativity and numerous inventions have paved the way for how we study animal locomotion today. Now, the world is filled with an incredible breadth of diversity. Animals come in all shapes and sizes. And with this diversity, they have evolved to live in almost every environment imaginable. In these environments, they experience unique pressures, mechanical demands that shape how they look and how they function. The questions one could ask about these relationships are really almost endless. So in the interest of time, I'm going to stick to one little piece of the puzzle that I find particularly fascinating, and that's terrestrial locomotion, how animals move on land. Locomotion is fundamental to nearly all animals. Animals have to move to find food or avoid becoming food. Animals have to move to find mates or find suitable habitats, sometimes migrating over thousands of kilometers like these wildebeest. For animals like this, Efficiency is key. How can you go the greatest distance using the least amount of energy? On the other end of the spectrum, you have an animal like this, Komodo dragon. For these animals, it's all about speed and power to catch their prey. For their success, it happens over very short distances and can be over in the blink of an eye. With all of this diversity, one might expect that animals could move in almost an infinite number of ways. However, for the most part, animals actually settled on relatively few solutions for getting from place to place. So no matter if you move about on two legs, four legs, or even six legs, there are a handful of governing principles that seem to underlie all types of locomotion. When moving slow, like walking, the leg behaves like a strut, where the body vaults up and over like an inverted pendulum. So when we take a step, the kinetic energy gets converted into potential energy and then back to kinetic energy as we fall into our next step. And this exchange of energy actually reduces the cost that it takes for an animal to walk. At faster speeds, animals shift to more bouncing gates, like running, trotting, or hopping. In these bouncing gates, the legs behave like a spring. So the leg compresses when the, leg, when the foot hits the ground. Tendons and ligaments stretch, storing energy, and that energy is returned as the animal leaves the ground again. And it's this elastic storage of energy that reduces the cost of locomotion at fast speeds. Perhaps no gait better fits this model of locomotion than bipedal hopping. So when I ask you to think about an animal that hops, what comes to mind? A frog? Eh. Frogs don't hop. Frogs actually jump. They may jump several times in a row, but each motion is its own independent jump. How about a bunny? Eh. <laughs> Bunnies use something called a quadrupedal bound. That is, their front legs hit the ground alternating with their back legs. All right. Who said kangaroo? Show of hands. Yes. So bouncing, or bipedal hopping, is characterized by a continuous bouncing motion in which only the back legs hit the ground. And no other animal exemplifies this better than the iconic Australian kangaroo. But why hop? Why not walk or run? 50 years ago, 
Researchers at Harvard University, in the same lab where I got my PhD, put a kangaroo on a treadmill and made a remarkable discovery. By measuring the oxygen that they consume at faster and faster speeds, they found out that kangaroos were different than any other animal they had measured. So for most animals, and humans, as we run faster, the rate in which we consume oxygen increases, up till the point where you simply can't get enough oxygen. And for some of us, that point comes sooner than for others. But kangaroos are different. As soon as they start hopping, the rate at which they consume oxygen plateaus. So it doesn't matter if they're hopping about at a slow speed or going flat out across the desert outback. They use the same amount of oxygen. And because oxygen is a measure of how much energy we're using to perform a task, this means that at the fastest speeds, kangaroos are the most efficient animal on the planet. Now, this has been found for not only kangaroos, but their smaller cousins, the wallabies, down to about a three kilogram or six and a half pound limit. So anything above that has this energetic benefit, and anything below doesn't. We'll get back to that in a minute. Okay, so how? How are these animals able to cheat the energetic demands that all other species seem to have to follow? The answer to this, at least in part, lies in the muscles and the tendons of those massive back legs, and particularly what's going on with the ankle and the Achilles tendon. So to understand this, we need to take a minute to talk about how muscles produce force and how they use energy. So we'll look at two muscles in this leg. The first muscle is a hip extensor. It's what we call a hamstring. In these muscles, the muscle fibers run from end to end. They're relatively long, and they attach either to a bone or a relatively short tendon. And because all of these fibers are aligned, we call it a parallel fibered muscle. The second muscle is an ankle extensor, something like a calf muscle. And in these muscles, there are a lot of really short fibers that attach at an angle to a central tendon. And because of this angle, we call these muscles pennate. But to understand how they work, we'll look at them as a simple cylinder. So how much force a muscle can produce is determined by how many muscle fibers are acting together. So we can, this is proportional to the cross-sectional area of the muscle. How far and how fast a muscle can contract is proportional to the length of the muscle. And this is important for how much power that muscle can produce. So in this example, the ankle muscle can produce twice as much force as the hamstring, but it can only shorten it about 25% as fast. So why not have a muscle that can do both? Why not have a big cross-section area and a long length? It's expensive. So the rate at which muscles use energy is determined by its volume, its cross-section area times its length. And this is key for the efficiency of kangaroos. So in kangaroos, those ankle extensor muscles are packed with these pinnate muscles that generate a tremendous amount of force at a relatively low cost. And these muscles are attached to long, thin Achilles tendons that stretch and store a lot of energy and return it when they leave the ground. And the amount of energy they store actually increases with hopping speed. So at faster and faster speeds, this elastic energy replaces what would otherwise have to be produced by the muscles. So basically, kangaroos are biological pogo sticks. All right, so we talked about why kangaroos and wallabies hop. But they're not the only animals that do. In fact, bipedal hopping has evolved at least five times completely independently, once in the kangaroo family tree, and four times at least within rodent species. Now, through a, a process called convergent evolution, all of these bipedal hopping species have arrived at a very similar body plan. That is, they all have the massive hind legs tiny little arms, and a long tail that they need for balance. But unlike the kangaroos and wallabies, most of these rodent bipedal hoppers are small, well under a pound. And they don't have that same 
energetic benefit. So why do they hop? Well, to understand this, well, let's compare two species. On the top, we have a Tamar wallaby, about the size of a small dog. And on the bottom, we have a desert kangaroo rat, a little bit smaller than a softball. Despite being 50, the tamer wallaby being 50 times heavier than the kangaroo rat, they do share that similar body plan, at least externally. But the underlying muscle tendon and anatomy is very different, particularly that Achilles tendon. So while kangaroo rats do have a relatively long tendon, it's very, very thick for their body size, several times thicker than the wallaby's tendon for its size. So when kangaroo rats hop, these tendons don't stretch and store energy like they do in the wallaby. So why not? You'd think energy storage is a good thing. These tendons are designed to transmit extremely high forces very rapidly from muscle to bone. And they need this for one important reason, escape. So this phenomenal footage is, is shot by a colleague of mine and his research team, Dr. Roland Clark, down at San Diego State. They do awesome work studying the behavioral interactions between predators and prey. So these kangaroo rats and most of the other small species, they live in open desert environments in which their primary predators are snakes and owls. These animals have to get out of the way this is far more important to them than covering some distance efficiently. Many of them have evolved to jump to extraordinary heights. So these animals can jump 10 times their hip height. 10 times hip height. Think how high you could jump if you were a kangaroo rat. These animals are also remarkably stable. So here we see a kangaroo rat hopping on soft sand. This is on a treadmill in our lab, being encouraged by a graduate student. Uh, hopping on this soft sand and then transitions over a really complex rocky environment. And they don't lose their balance at all. Try that on a pogo stick. So this is all very cool. But why should we care? Why does it matter? Well, when I began talking, I said that despite all of this diversity, animals have settled on a relatively small number of general principles from terrestrial locomotion. And at fat speeds, they behave like springs. So this is true whether you're a kangaroo or a running human. By understanding that running can be modeled like a spring, we've been able to break down barriers for people who have suffered traumatic injury or illness. By understanding that fast locomotion can be modeled as a spring, Engineers have developed prosthetics that enable athletes to compete at the highest level, including the Olympics. Now, there's much about these things we still don't know. These devices don't replace all of the biological function that was lost. And we still don't really even know how they control them. But this is ongoing research, and we are extraordinarily happy to be working with the US Paralympic team. Phenomenal athletes, phenomenal individuals. So there's much work yet to be done here. But if studying a kangaroo can help us, can help an amputee athlete reach the Olympics, what will the next bio-inspired invention achieve? With so much diversity, with so much left to learn, I personally believe the possibilities are endless. Thank you.